I'd like to welcome you to our second webinar in a four-part series on youth opioid, opioids and ESPERT. And this is the beginning um, portion on ESPERT. So today we're going to be talking about screening. We're also going to be launching our first school-based health ESPERT quick guide today, which is also focused on screening. And I'll talk more about that at the end of today's webinar. We'd like to thank our funders from the California Youth Opioid Response for supporting this project and this webinar. And if you haven't already, here is the uh, phone number and access code to call in to the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded and the materials will be shared on our website within the next week. Um, this will have both the recording, the slides, and the screening quick guide that I mentioned in the beginning. We also, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box on the side and we'll have time to hopefully answer those at the end. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce you all to James Peck. James has a PsyD and is a licensed clinical psychologist and senior clinical trainer at the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Program, ISAP. For nearly a decade, Dr. Peck conducted phase two clinical trials of behavioral and pharmacological interventions for stimulant dependence. Dr. Peck has extensive experience conducting curriculum development, clinical trainings, and clinical su supervision on the etiology, assessment, and treatment of substance-related disorders and on the treatment of individuals with co-occurring substance-related and psychiatric disorders. He currently works at UCLA in a primarily clinical training role and maintains a busy practice treating individuals with co-occurring disorders. Uh, just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. We're a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health and health services in schools. Um, we basically do this in two ways. Um, we have two concepts that we focus on, that healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. We do this through a variety of ways, capacity building, technical assistance, and webinars like the one that we're um, giving today. And also this is um, the link to our website where the recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be located. Also, just a little bit of information about our membership. Um, if you're a member with us, you will get a conference registration discount. There's also member-only tools and resources and technical assistance that is tailored to your organizational needs. If you're interested in becoming a member, you can sign up on that link um, on the screen. Okay, fantastic. Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this over to Jim. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate you being here, given everything that's going on in the world today, and many of us having to try to get used to working at home. So welcome. Um, we are partly funded by uh, SAMHSA's State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Grant, which created the Opioid Response Network to assist uh, targeted response grantees and individuals and other organizations to provide resources and technical assistance in addressing the opioid crisis. TA is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorders. Uh, the Opioid Response Network provides local experienced consultants in prevention and treatment and recovery to communities and organizations to help address the opioid crisis. Um, the ORN accepts requests for education and training. And each state or territory has a designated team led by a regional technology transfer specialist, uh, like my colleague Benjamin Nguyen, who is on this, the webinar with us today, who is an expert in implementing evidence-based practices. And I'll leave this here for just a few seconds in case anyone would like to write this down, the email address, the website, and the phone number. If you would like to submit a request for technical assistance on anything, anything opioid related, really. All right, so with that, we'll start out with ESPER today. Uh, ESPER stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Today's part one uh, on screening. 
and we'll have a part two on in brief interventions uh, next month, I believe. So what we'd like for you to do today is to be able to summarize the background and rationale for SBIRT, especially for youth use among youth, adolescents, and students. We'd like you to be able to recognize the prevalence rates of opioid use along with alcohol and other drug use among youth. And we'd like you to be able to apply uh, youth-related alcohol and drug screening tools to be able to detect substance use, um, including but not limited to opioid use. So in 2013, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommended that clinicians screen adults 18 and older for alcohol misuse and give those uh, reporting risky or hazardous drinking a brief intervention to reduce alcohol misuse. And in some states like California, adolescent Medi-Cal beneficiaries ages 11 to 17 now are also supposed to be getting an annual screening in primary care settings using a screener called the CRAFT, which we will cover uh, in a while. So this entire, the SBIRT uh, process and procedure began with the American College of Surgeons uh, Trauma Committee. They decided that trauma, level one and two trauma centers need a mechanism to identify patients who are problem drinkers, and level one trauma centers need to also have the ability to provide a brief intervention for patients identified as problem drinkers. The reason this began in uh, uh, trauma centers is because of, uh, such a large proportion of the cases coming into trauma centers are alcohol and drug related. So we know uh, there are a lot of medical consequences of substance use and misuse um, can lead to unintentional injuries and violence. It can exacerbate existing medical conditions, diabetes, hypertension, sleep disorders are just a few of them. Definitely can exacerbate psychiatric conditions. Uh, I see patients all the time who are using substances and it's interacting with their depression, their bipolar disorder, their anxiety disorder, et cetera. Uh, it can induce, induce injuries and illnesses can result in infectious diseases and infections. Uh, HIV and hepatitis C in particular are often associated with alcohol and or drug use. Can affect the efficacy of prescribed medications. So if someone is using an illicit substance while they're taking a prescribed medication, they may need to either increase or decrease the, the amount of medication that they're taking because of the fact that the illicit drug that they're using is affecting uh, how effective that medication is. We know that the abuse of prescription medications has been the fastest growing segment of substance use in the last few years, primarily the uh, prescription painkillers. For pregnant women, uh, substance use can result in low birth weight, premature deliveries, and developmental disorders. And if misuse, let's call it, uh, continues for a period of time, it can result in dependence and or what we call in the DSM-5 a severe substance use disorder. And that often requires multiple treatment episodes in order to effectively address it. So substance use has a major impact on public health. In any given year, about 30 million Americans are current users of illicit drugs. Uh, by far the, the most common of those is marijuana. Uh, this has grown uh, since so many states have legalized marijuana, either for uh, medical purposes or recreational purposes or both. But second on the list is prescription pain reliever misuse, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar. Um, prescription pain reliever misuse like Vicodin or OxyContin is the second highest category of substance use, followed by cocaine, prescription stimulants uh, like Adderall or Ritalin, prescription tranquilizers like Xanax or Ativan or Valium, and then hallucinogens, methamphetamine, inhalants, heroin, and prescription sedative misuse. Prescription sedatives uh, are things like Ambien. If we look at alcohol, however, slightly more than half of Americans age 12 or older report, reported being current drinkers of alcohol. Um, and that translates to about 140 million drinkers, uh, which is why alcohol is one of the primary focuses of SBIRT as well, in addition to illicit substances. 
Okay, let's look at uh, the prevalence of drinking and drug use among adolescents. And the information I'm going to share with you comes from a survey called Monitoring the Future, which is done by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is the NIH Institute that focuses on drug use. It's an annual survey of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. It's been going on since 1975 with uh, 12th graders, and 8th and 10th graders were added in 1991. And about 42,000 students from about 400 public and private schools participated in the survey last year. So this is going to be some data from the survey that was done last year. And for some reason, my screen is cutting off. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so in terms of overall illicit drug use, any past year illicit drug use among 12th graders held steady at about 38%. That's been constant, fairly constant for a number of years now. If you subtract marijuana from that, about 11.5% are reporting use of a substance uh, other than marijuana. And then if you look over on the right-hand side of the screen, past year illicit drug use among 12th graders, marijuana uh, is the by far the most commonly used illicit drug. Uh, in the second set of charts, daily marijuana use, if you look under on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, daily marijuana use saw a significant increase among 8th and 10th graders uh, just between 2018 and 2019. On the right-hand side, in terms of past year marijuana use, the gap is closing between 10th graders and 12th graders. That means more 10th graders are using marijuana uh, than used to be using marijuana. If we look at uh, prescription opioids, the Vicodin and OxyContin, the good news is that both Vicodin and OxyContin use uh, have declined from their height in 2009. They've declined significantly. Um, held steady, though, between 2018 and 2019 among eighth graders, and OxyContin actually went up a little bit among eighth graders uh, between 2014 and 2019. So that's not such good news, and there, there is, there's more news in here about eighth graders that we will get to. Uh, like this one, for instance, Adderall misuse. Uh, Adderall declined among 10th graders and 12th graders between 2014 and 2019, but it actually increased among 8th graders. So we've got uh, almost twice as many 8th graders using Adderall uh, as there were in 2014. Tobacco and nicotine. Um, we've done a really good job with cigarette use. Um, cigarette past month cigarette uh, smoking continued to decline among all three age groups. Um, daily use of nicotine by vaping uh, outpaced cigarette smoking. So we've got we've done a good job with cigarette smoking, but vaping of nicotine uh, is now far outpacing the number of students who are smoking cigarettes. In terms of alcohol. Um, past year alcohol use uh, is declining in all three uh, age groups, which is good news. And binge drinking as well declined in all three age groups. Binge drinking is defined as five or more drinks at a time sometime in the past two weeks. Vaping, again, uh, daily nicotine vaping was measured for the first time in 2019 uh, and close to 12% of 12th graders acknowledged daily nicotine vaping. If you look at past month use of nicotine vaping, fully 25% of 12th graders acknowledged past month nicotine vaping. And 20%, about 20% of 10th graders acknowledged past month uh, use of nicotine by vaping methods. So that's a one in four 12th graders and one in five 10th graders who are vaping nicotine. Um, so that's obviously very concerning. Um, if we look at past month uh, marijuana vaping, as you can see, from 20, just from 2018 to 2019, that has gone up significantly. Um, and there's very little difference between the 10th graders and the 12th graders at this point. And in fact, the, the increase there is the second largest one-year increase that was ever tracked for any substance 
in the history of this survey. So vaping of marijuana products um, is obviously very concerning. And if we look at the reasons why teens report uh, vaping, um, the vast majority, 60% uh, or so, report that they do it to experiment, to see what it's like. Um, the number of teens reporting reasons to get high or to relax or relieve tension increased significantly from 2018 to 2019. And the reason, because I'm hooked, I have to have it more than doubled just between 2018 and 2019. So you're seeing the number of kids who are saying, I'm acknowledging I'm hooked on it, uh, I'm addicted to it, doubled uh, between 2018 and 2019. The to relax or relieve tension is also a concern. That significantly increased between 2018 and 2019. And that suggests that the teens that are, are learning that vaping relieves things like anxiety. Um, and we'll see more about that uh, in a little bit. But it says that teens are, are learning at a relatively young age that a negative uh, emotional or psychological state like anxiety or depression can be relieved by vaping, which is not so good. So why do we want to screen for underage drinking and drug use? Obviously, it's common, as we just saw on the previous slides. It's risky. Uh, it can result in unintentional injuries and deaths. Suicidality is another big issue. Uh, aggression and victimization. Infections and unintended pregnancies. Academic and social problems. Increased risk for alcohol and drug problems later in life. And it's a marker for other un unhealthy behaviors. So drinking, smoking tobacco, and illicit or prescription drug use and unprotected sex are all risk factors for each other. Um, and it often goes undetected uh, and becomes more severe. This is a really interesting study. It was just published last year. Uh, they looked at over 3,000 high school students in the Los Angeles area, and they found that teens who use prescription opioids when they're younger are more likely to start using heroin by the time they graduate from high school. So they enrolled freshmen and followed them through their senior year it was a diverse sample of students. It was racially and ethnically diverse. It was diverse in terms of gender, about half and half, male and female. And these next four bullet points are the ones that concern me. 35% reported depressive symptoms. Oh, about a third of students reported depressive symptoms. The prevalence of depression in the general population is at 7 or 8%. So this is about five times the level of depression in the general population. That's very concerning. Same thing with anxiety symptoms, 22% reported anxiety symptoms. The prevalence in the general population of anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder is three or 4%. So obviously, again, this is at least five times uh, the prevalence rate in the general population. Another thing that's really concerning is 70% of them reported a family history of substance use. So we know that substance use often is intergenerational. Um, what we often think about teens learning to use substances from their peers, this suggests that the, the majority of them are learning about substances probably starting in their families. Um, so that's very concerning. And almost 600 of them reported opioid use, and that's about 20% of them. That's a huge number. When we looked at uh, a few slides back at Vicodin and OxyContin, was in the neighborhood of 3% of students uh, using OxyContin or Vicodin. This is about 20% in this particular sample of high school students. So that's a huge uh, increase. So it suggests that we may have a, a, a greater problem with students using opioids uh, in California than what we see nationally. Okay, so what exactly is ESPERT? ESPERT is a comprehensive, integrated, public health approach to the delivery of early intervention and treatment services, both for individuals with substance use disorders and folks at risk of developing substance use disorders. And I'm gonna make this distinction a couple of times today. We're not just trying to catch people who have a diagnosable substance use disorder. We're trying to catch folks who are using at risky or hazardous levels who are at risk of developing a DSM-5 substance use disorder. And primary care centers, trauma centers, and school-based health programs 
provide really good opportunities for early intervention with at-risk substance users uh, before they get to the point where they're having more severe consequences. The goals of EFFORT are to increase access to care for people with substance use disorders and those at risk of developing them, foster more of a continuum of care by integrating prevention, intervention, and treatment services, and to improve linkages between the larger healthcare system and alcohol and drug treatment services, because historically we haven't done a very good job. Uh, if you look at studies of how people found their way to substance use treatment programs, very few of them got there from the larger healthcare system. Um, and that's rather concerning. And that's one of the things we're trying to address with SBIRT. Some key terms that we'll be using. Screening is a very brief set of questions that identifies the risk of substance-related problems, typically between three and 10 questions. Uh, brief intervention is brief counseling that focuses on raising awareness of risks and then motivating a client or patient or student toward acknowledging that there is a problem and maybe they need to do something to address that problem. Brief treatment is CBT, cognitive behavioral work with students who acknowledge risks and are seeking help. That might be sort of a, a two to five session uh, brief treatment episode. And referrals, obviously we're, we, we need to, for those at the kind of the top of the pyramid of, of use uh, by adolescents, uh, those who have a diagnosable substance use disorder, we wanna be able to refer them effectively to specialized services. So brief interventions we know can trigger change. A little bit of counseling can lead to significant change. So studies have shown that a five minute brief intervention can sometimes have the same impact as a 20 minute brief intervention. Um, that's when we're looking at alcohol. The research is less extensive for illicit drugs, but it is promising. For instance, cocaine and heroin users seen in primary care settings uh, were about 50%, had a 50% greater chance of being abstinent at a follow-up visit after getting a brief intervention than those who didn't get a brief intervention. What do we wanna do with brief interventions? Ultimately, we want to bring about behavior change. So the question is, how do we do that? And the first step is there needs to be awareness of a problem. If someone is coming in and we're telling them that they probably have a problem, they're telling us that they don't have a problem, there's no awareness there that there is something to focus on. So, so first thing we need to do is generate awareness that there is a problem. And then we want to increase motivation to bring about behavior change. And we'll talk more about that with the, in the brief intervention uh, webinar. A couple of ways that we can generate awareness that there actually might be a problem here. One is the presenting problem. Why are they there to see you today in the first place? The other is the screening results. So we're gonna use the screeners and we'll, we're gonna look at two of them in a little bit. Um, we can use the screening results to start to raise awareness that there's a problem. The presenting problem is a good one as well because you can begin to make a connection for students um, between whatever their presenting problem is and their alcohol or drug use. The more we can make that connection, um, typically the more effective brief interventions are. We look at substance use problems uh, among mental health and or primary care populations. It's a large group of folks down at the bottom of the pyramid uh, who are non-users or low-risk users. The group in the middle, what we might call hazardous or harmful users, they don't yet have a diagnosable substance use disorder, but their behavior is placing them at risk for developing one. And so over on the right-hand side there, you can see the S, B, and I are highlighted. And so we're going to do a screening and brief intervention with those folks. The folks, like I mentioned at the, a minute ago, at the top of the pyramid, the severe problem users, these are folks with a DSM-5 substance use disorder. Uh, we're going to do a brief intervention but that's going to be oriented toward referral to treatment. So why screening and brief intervention? Substance use is a global public health issue. It's not just an issue for us. And substance use, as we know, has been around for, for as long as mankind pretty much has been around and people learned how to ferment things. Uh, it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And as with most things, the earlier we can identify it and intervene, the better the outcomes are likely to be. If we look at the top 10 risk factors for disease globally, first is being underweight. 
Second is unsafe sex. Third is hypertension. And four and five are tobacco and alcohol. So if we were just looking at the US, we would have to flip some of these around. But disease, disease burden globally, tobacco and alcohol are number four and five. So they're high up on the list. They're followed by unsafe water, sanitation, and hygiene, iron deficiency, indoor smoke from solid fuels, cholesterol we would expect to see on the list, and obesity, um, which we would actually have to move closer to the top of the list if we were just looking at the US. But the point is that tobacco and alcohol are the number four and five uh, causes of disease burden globally. Key to successful interventions, as I mentioned a minute ago, brief interventions tend to be most successful when we can relate their risky substance use to improvement in their overall health and, well, health and well-being. Why are they there to see you today? Draw a connection between those things to the extent that you can. So the implications are that as long as specialty care programs or substance use treatment programs are the only places that actually address substance use, most people with severe substance-related problems aren't going to get treatment, and virtually everybody with moderately risky use is not going to get the attention that might have prevented escalation to more severe consequences. So that's why we're trying to implement ESPER in a lot of different settings, including school-based health centers. Uh, a lot of different locations we can do this. Primary care uh, is being done in ERs and trauma centers, prenatal clinics and OBGYN offices, school health centers, pediatrician's offices as well. College health centers are a big one. Uh, mental health settings, infectious disease clinics, because as we mentioned before, there's often a strong correlation between substance use and infectious diseases, uh, and DUI programs. So some opportunities and indications for screening. When might you, when might you uh, use ESPER with a particular student? Might be students who you haven't seen before, so they're there for the first time. Students who are likely to drink, like students who smoke. Smoking is a risk factor for drinking also. Uh, if they have conditions associated with increased risk for substance use, like depression or anxiety or conduct behavior problems. If they have health problems that might be alcohol or drug related, like accidents or injuries, sexually transmitted infections or unintended pregnancies, changes in eating or sleeping patterns, gastrointestinal disturbances, or chronic pain. Chronic pain is another one that doesn't affect uh, youth as much as it does adults, typically, uh, but chronic pain is, is a huge trigger for substance use for many people. Um, and those who show substantial behavioral changes, like increased oppositional behavior, mood changes, loss of interest in activities, a drop in grades or unexcused school absences. So we're going to do some screening. Hopefully you can tell what's going on in this picture. Um, it's a TSA checkpoint, security checkpoint, uh, where we're doing screening. There's not much of that going on these days, uh, but that is a TSA screening checkpoint. And what we're doing there, who goes through that? Everybody goes through that. Right, so we ultimately we want to filter as many people through the screening process as we can. Um, the folks who screen positive are then going to get a secondary assessment, and this is a, it's a good analogy for what we're trying to do with ESPER is we're going to screen as many students as possible, and then that identifies uh, students who need further assessment and potentially a brief intervention. Um, it's important to have the same language to, uh, when we're talking about if we're asking someone how many drinks they typically have uh, at one time when they are drinking and we're talking about a 12 ounce beer and they're talking about a 40 ounce beer, we're not talking about the same thing. So the NIAAA, which is the NIH Institute that focuses on alcohol and alcoholism, uh, put out a set of drinking guidelines, lower risk drinking guidelines uh, a number of years ago for men, no more than four drinks at a time and 14 drinks per week. For women, it's no more than three drinks at a time or seven drinks per week because women metabolize alcohol a little bit differently than men do. And for both men and women over 65, it's no more than three drinks at a time or seven drinks per week. 
our understanding is that the 14 drinks per week uh, for men is being reevaluated because that seems like a fairly high number to many of us. Um, and this was based on research that they did uh, in terms of people developing health conditions uh, related to drinking, but still 14 seems like kind of a lot of, of drinks in one week. We don't want to wind up with something like this. Uh, if we're talking about a 12 ounce beer and the client or student is talking about a 40 ounce beer, uh, we could end up with something like this. The caption says, although they restricted themselves to one drink at lunchtime, Alan and Roger found that they were not at their most productive in the afternoons. All right, so introducing the screener, how we introduce it matters. So we want to set things up so that we get as honest answers as possible. So we can introduce it something along these lines. Uh, I'm going to ask you some personal questions about alcohol and drugs that we ask all of our students. Your responses will be confidential. These questions help us to provide the best possible care. And you don't have to answer them if you're uncomfortable answering them. So the two screening tools that we're going to look at today, one is called the S2BI and the other is the CRAFT. S2BI stands for Screening to Brief Intervention. And we'll, I'll show you what the CRAFT stands for in a minute. So using, again, uh, administering the S2BI, we're going to either ask the student these questions or hand them a piece of paper or a tablet or something like that and ask them to do it themselves. We tend to find that you get more honest answers if you hand them the piece of paper and have them do it themselves rather than you asking the questions. So ask them to complete the first three questions on the S2BI, and we're gonna see what this looks like in just a minute. If all three responses are never, we're gonna stop there. Just provide some positive reinforcement. Good for you, sounds like you're making some healthy choices. If any of those three responses is something other than never, you're gonna have them answer the remaining S2BI questions and then follow the decision tree on the slide titled S2BI actions, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. So this is the S2BI. Um, the following questions will ask about your use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Please answer every question by checking the box next to your choice. So these are the first three that we're talking about. In the past year, how many times have you used tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana? The response categories are never, once or twice, monthly, or weekly, or more. So if they answer never to all of those, then you can stop there. And if you're handing the student a sheet of paper with the S2BI on it and having them do it themselves, they would have these instructions on it. Stop here if answers to all previous questions are never, otherwise continue with the following questions. Um, if we continue with the additional questions, we're going to ask about prescription drugs that were not prescribed for you, such as pain medication or Adderall, illegal drugs like cocaine or ecstasy, inhalants like nitrous oxide or something that you are huffing, and herbs or synthetic drugs like salvia or K2 or bath salts. Uh, salvia is a, a plant that provides a mild uh, stimulant effect. K2, uh, it provides a mild hallucinogenic effect and, and bath salts provide a mild uh, stimulant effect that kind of mimics the uh, effects of cocaine or methamphetamine. So we're going to have them answer again, never once or twice, monthly or weekly or more on all of these. And then the way that it is scored, if you, each question that is never, obviously that represents no recorded use. Each time they say once or twice, that's somewhat risky, but it's a considered lower risk. If they say monthly or weekly, that's higher risk. Um, and what we do with this is going to depend on those scores. So if any of the questions on the S2BI are no you, if they're all never, we would just use positive reinforcement, say, great, it sounds like you're making healthy choices. If any of the substances is marked once or twice, we would then ask the follow-up S2BI questions about the other substances, 
and then provide some brief advice, um, something along the lines of, would it be okay if I gave you some information about what these substances can do uh, to you in terms of uh, affecting your developing brain, um, uh, causing you to have reduced grades, causing problems in your relationships, in your family, that sort of thing, um, and leave it at that. If they answer monthly or weekly on any of those first three questions, we're going to ask the first, we're going to ask the follow-up S2BI questions. So we're going to ask about the other substances and we're going to administer the craft. We're then going to do a brief motivational intervention. We'll assess for the problems. We'll advise them to reduce using or quit using altogether and make a plan, have them set a goal that makes, that feels realistic to them. Um, tend to have better results if they are choosing their own goals than if we are telling them what they ought to be doing. And then if, they re if they've reported monthly use, we're going to do the brief intervention. It's going to be uh, oriented toward reducing or stopping their use and the risky behaviors that go along with them. If they have reported weekly or greater use on any of those substances, we are going to do a brief intervention uh, we're, we'll talk about reducing their use and risky behaviors, and we're going to do a referral to treatment. Sorry, I have a very, very small arrows here I have to click on in order to advance the slides. The craft, so the craft is the secondary screener that we're going to use if we have a positive S2BI. It's a behavioral, and the CRAFT stands for CAR, Relax, Alone, Forget, Family, and Trouble. It's a behavioral health screening tool for use with adolescents and young adults under the age of 21. And it's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse for use with adolescents. It's, six, it's three introductory questions and then six questions developed to screen adolescents for both alcohol and drug use simultaneously, which is nice because most of the uh, screeners we have for adults screen for either alcohol or drugs. Um, the craft asks about both for adolescents, and it was designed specifically for adolescents. It's short and it's effective, and it's not designed necessarily to be diagnostic. It's designed to assess whether we need to have a longer conversation about the context of their alcohol or drug use the frequency of it, and other risks and consequences of, of alcohol and other drug use is warranted. Um, and both, both of these screening instruments are public domain. Uh, you can get them online. And we're actually going to look at the CRAFT 2.0, which is the second version. Um, similar to the original CRAFT, the, the 2.0 is validated for use with adolescents age 12 to 18. It starts with past 12 months frequency items rather than the old version of the craft ask yes or no uh, for any use over the past year. That new set of frequency test questions was tested in a recent study of about 700 adolescent primary care patients and found good sensitivity and specificity for detecting past 12 month use of any substance. That suggests better performance in identifying substance use compared to that of the yes or no questions that were found in the prior study with the original version of the CRAFT. So the CRAFT 2.0 instructions, if the student answers zero to all of the opening frequency of use questions, then we're going to ask the CAR question, and you'll see what that is in a minute. We're only going to ask the CAR question. If they provided an answer that's greater than zero to any of the frequency of use questions, we're going to ask the full set of six CRAFT questions. Two or more yes answers to any of the craft questions indicates an elevated risk for a substance use disorder and a need for further assessment. A one I'll talk about in a minute. One is sort of uh, on, the, on the edge of a positive versus a negative uh, screen. Further, that further assessment may include a follow-up visit with you uh, or, and or a referral to substance use treatment. So this is the craft 2.0, the first three questions uh, similar to the S2BI, have you, during the past 12 months, it used to say, have you, yes or no, done any of these things? Now it says, on how many days did you drink more than a few sips of beer, wine, or any drink containing alcohol? 
use any marijuana, uh, pot, weed, hash, or in foods. So we're getting to edibles as well or synthetic marijuana, like K2 or spice? Or did you use anything else to get high, like other illegal drugs, prescription or over-the-counter medications, and things that you sniff or huff? And if all of those are zero, they're gonna answer question four, and then they're gonna stop. If any of those three screening questions was one or higher, they're going to answer all of the next six questions, uh, questions four through nine which are these, have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself or fit in? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you're by yourself alone? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? So scores range from zero to six. It's just however many yes responses they have on the craft, um, that's their score from zero to six. So obviously a score of zero is no evidence of risk um, and we don't need to really do anything with that except again, maybe a little bit of positive reinforcement. Score of one or more is considered a positive screen, although again, as I said a minute ago, one is sort of on the border. Um, it, it is technically considered a positive screen, but it's considered a, a low risk positive screen. Uh, only about a 30% chance that they have a substance use disorder with a score of one. Two or higher is definitely a positive screen and indicates the need for further assessment. And that further assessment would start with Going back and looking at what quest, which of these questions did they answer yes on and asking them a little bit more about them. Um, okay, so you said that sometimes you use uh, alcohol or drugs to relax or feel better about yourself or fit in. Tell me a little bit more about that. Try to get a sense of the context of their use of whether it's alcohol or drugs. Try to get a sense of frequency. How often do they use it and how much do they use? Those are important variables to know. Um, and the likelihood of having a substance use disorder increases with the number of yes responses. So as I said, with a, a score of one, uh, there's only about a 30, I think it's 32%, yeah, 32% chance of having a, and this is having a DSM-5 diagnosable substance use disorder. With a score of two, it jumps up to 64%. So it's two thirds chance that they have a diagnosable substance use disorder. With three, it jumps up to almost 80%. And then with four, five, and six, it's virtually certain that this is someone who has a substance use disorder and needs to be referred to substance use disorder treatment. Okay, so what do we do with all of this screening information is the next question. And that's what the next webinar is going to focus on when we look at brief interventions. Um, I believe Sierra has been keeping track of any questions that may have come up in the chat box. Um, so I'm going to let her uh, tell me what those are and we can answer, hopefully answer those for you. Great. So if at this time you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and type them over in the chat or the Q&A boxes on uh, the sidebar. We'll wait a few minutes for people to, to type. And this, while you're thinking about possible questions, this is a, a screening quick guide that Sierra and her colleagues developed, um, basically going over a lot of what we just went over in terms of screening uh, in a school-based health setting. Mm -hmm. And just to, to add to what Jim is saying is that basically it's, um, it, it goes a little bit about in-depth about CRAFT and SQBI, but it's really a quick guide. So just two pages back in front um, that you can reference. And it also goes over implementation questions if you're new to implementing SBIRT and especially screening to your school-based health center. Um, and just also to follow up, Jim mentioned our brief intervention webinar, which is gonna be our next 
uh, our next webinar in the series. It's going to be on April 21st, and you can sign up on our website, the same place where you can find the, um, the quick guide and the uh, recording and uh, slides for today, probably within the next week. I don't, oh, I have one here, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat on my end. I have one Q&A, but it's giving me issues with reading it. Um, do you need parent consent to complete the screening? Yeah, I think that the answer to that, generally speaking, is no. Um, in California, students, uh, kids, as long as they're over the age of 12, they can consent to uh, substance use uh, treatment. So my sense is if they can consent to treatment, then they consent to be screened, um, that you don't need a parent in order to do the screening. Okay, any other questions? Yes, we got another one in. Give me one second. Did you say you saw another question, Sierra, or no? Yeah, I did, um, but for some reason it's not letting me see it. If the person who sent the second question, if you could send it into the, um, copy it into the chat box, that would be fantastic. The Q&A box is giving me some issues. Okay. So it looks like we have another one that just came in, but I, I, it's, um, it's giving me issues in terms of reading the questions. So if uh, you all could be sending them in the chat box rather than the Q&A. So I, I can, can see some of the questions. I have one okay. from Sandra Marquez. Do you need, is there was, do you need parent consent to complete the screening? And then there is their follow-up screening at the end of treatment. And that was the one that just kept kind of getting put in there again? Is there follow-up screening at the end of treatment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the end of treatment, typically uh, when you're doing substance use disorder treatment, you, you are doing an, some sort of assessment at the, end, uh, at the end point. It might not be at the same, it might not be the same screener, but it would be some type of screen or assessment uh, tool. Ben, do you see any others? Uh, nope, I think that was the last one so far, but I'm monitoring it too. <laughs> okay, great, fantastic, thank you. My name's doing issues on my end, thank you. No worries. Okay, well, um, if there are no more questions, We'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is we do have an evaluation that will automatically be popping up after this webinar. It's just five multiple choice questions, so if you could please um, answer them, we would greatly appreciate it. We'll uh, stay online for the next you know, few minutes just to see if any other uh, attendees have any questions come in. Otherwise, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate you coming to the webinar in, in, with everything that's going on right now. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks.
And it looks like there's still five people on, so. Yeah, that's what I see. Mm, I'm wondering if there's a way. Okay, I think I think that's good. We it's been a few minutes since we've had any other questions pop up. So thank you everyone for joining. Jim, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, and if you need to contact us, my contact information is is listed on the slide there. And Jim's had his up just a few minutes ago and will also be available um, on the website when we have the slide. Thank you everyone for, for attending. Bye. Take care, folks.